Welcome to another episode of Lily High on Life. And my very special guest today is someone I've known for, gosh, 30 years when I first went to Los Angeles, Rod Hardy. Rod, welcome to Lily High on Life. Thank you, Lily. It's nice to be here. You know, Rod, I've wanted to have you on the program for quite a while for quite a number of reasons. You're one of those people that naturally feels comfortable to people when you meet them. You've got a whole swag of accomplishments, which we'll talk about, but it's more your relationships with people and your very long lasting relationships with people, as well as the experiences that you've had living both in America as well as in Australia and coming from Australia that I'd really like to talk about. So what's going on right now for you? You're visiting Melbourne. What's going on in your life today? Well, I'm back in Melbourne. I've lived in the United States in Los Angeles for now on 30 years. Um, And I come back often because my family are actually back here in Melbourne now. So I'm here to see the grandchildren, Luna and Aura. Um, and who are the joys of my life. You have three children. I have two children, actually. Two sons, Brett and Troy. Uh, Brett's the, the father of uh, both Aura and Luna, and, and they're, the, they're the, the delight. They drive the engine in so many ways and bring me back to Melbourne, which is, which is really what I call home. And um, you've had three wives... I have. And I've known, I think I've known all of them. <laughs> you probably have too. So after, after three long-term relationships, what's your takeaway? Oh, goodness me, get to know yourself before you marry somebody. You know, it's all very fine getting to know them, uh, but you've got to know who you are first. And um, I got married very young. I was just 20, uh, and I was a father at 23, so it, um, it all happened in a very immature part of my life, I discovered afterwards. Uh, at the time, I thought I was very bright, very smart and knew everything. But in hindsight, I can see that I had a lot of things to learn and grow up. And I think every time, you know, you mentioned three wives. When I hear it, I remember when I was a kid, I used to say, if you're married once and it didn't work, well, that's a real shame. If you're married twice and it didn't work, then you're really a little foolish. Three times, I think you're an idiot. (laughs) But I also know that if I hadn't gone through that journey, I wouldn't be who I am today. And whatever the problems and things, as long as I... I mean, I've hurt people along the way that I wished I hadn't have. But at the same time, I had to go down that path to find out who I am. And that's where I'm situated right this very second. And as you were saying, you learned different things because your wives were very different from each other. All yeah. wonderful women, yes, um, but very different. So they, they taught you different things about yourself. And, and every one of them has taught me something special uh, that I thank them for. So in hindsight, now that, you know, would you, and I'm assuming you're very happy now because I've met your last wife, so... All is good. But um, in hindsight, how would you have done things differently? What what did you walk away from at the time? And now that you know what you know, how would you have done it differently? Well, firstly, I don't think you can do anything differently because it's already done. So, yes. I mean, I think that's one of the major philosophies of life for me is that when it's done, it's done. You've just got to keep moving in the now and then forward. Uh, But I look back in hindsight, and if somebody asked me that question, I'd say, um, just get... I repeat what I said up front. Get to know yourself before you expect to know anybody else. And I ask the question because for people listening who are having difficulties or challenges in their own relationships, at the time, you don't really know what to do or what the right thing is to do. Well, you think you do. You think you know everything. And what I've learned is you don't. Um, you know, the, the lesson to me in any relationship, and I'm not an expert at it, other than I've had several, uh, but the thing is to pause, you know, and, and also that nobody has to be right. Mm. I think that's the biggest lesson. You don't have to be a right fighter. You don't have but, to and, be. And the truth of the matter is, that I believe, you don't make mistakes Whatever you do at the time is the right thing to do at the time based on who you are and the experiences you've had. Yeah. 
So nothing is ever a mistake. But try not to keep making the same mistake. That's the key issue to everything in life. Try not to make... Uh, and that's a difficult thing for we as human beings. When we get it put into our system, we need to reboot our thinking. And, and I'm still rebooting it. I think we do it till the day we finally move on to the next whatever it may be. Absolutely. And the reason that you do keep making mistakes is because you haven't learned the, the reason. And mistakes is the wrong word, but having the same experiences over and over is because you haven't learned the lesson and you just need to keep learning it till yeah, you're sure. done. It's that's, not a... that's very true. That's very true. And I think, look, uh, you know, having had a, a number of relationships... I've discovered very clearly, I really have to know who I am. Um, and that's a hard thing to do when you put with another person who's got to know who they are. And then you find the magic and everything is about magic to me. Life is special. And you have very special relationships, especially with your kids as yes, well. Yes, very much so. So what do, you, what do you tell your kids? Do they ask you for advice? Do they... Um, I try not to give any advice to anybody. I try to just live it and if people get the experience because they've seen it in me, my kids in particular. I mean, I'm not there to tell them you're wrong. Uh, my job is to do whatever I can. And, of course, I, I have apologised to them for the fact that my relationships haven't survived. Um, and, and they have to forgive me uh, and, and then they can move on themselves. And I don't mean to forgive me because I've been a bad person and just to say, yes, you're right, you are bad, but I, they've got to forgive so that that little clump of darkness can be let go of and you can go on and find the next piece of lightness. Mm. And I remember them when they were young, living in LA, yeah. but I can't put the two together with the young men that they are now. And yes. I know Brett uh, yes. a little better than, um, than your other He is son. the most wonderful father. I am so proud of, and I, and I suppose that's what I look back on. I, I wonder, he is now the most wonderful father. I wonder, how did that happen? I must have done something right. Although we didn't live together throughout his young life, he was always around in my life. I wanted, you know, I, I, sometimes people want their children to be their friends. I wanted that in one way, but I was very cautious about just being a friend. You, if you're a parent, you have to be a parent. Yes. Um, there are times when you have to do things that may not be good, f you know, in the relationship with them. They look upon you as being the ogre. But I, I, all I kept doing was I want you t at some stage to treat me with respect and with trust. And I think I've hopefully done that with both my sons. And we have, we have a great relationship. And when I talk about you having very special relationships, um, I was very much privy to that with a mutual mutual friend who passed, Jane Healy. Absolutely. And I was in Los Angeles, but you were here in Melbourne for her mm -hmm. last yes. months and days. Yeah. And we talked on the phone mm -hmm. and she told me just what an incredible, amazing relationship you two had. Well, it was also about, it was about respect. Simple as that, you know. Jane was, as you know, and to the audience that are listening who probably don't know, was a beautiful soul, a good spirit. And I think, again, I seem to find myself attracted to people who give back that energy. Uh, the dark side of life doesn't interest me. I'm a filmmaker, you know. I, I, I look for stories constantly. But what I find I'm being attracted to are projects that are about hope. And Jane certainly showed a lot of that. And her courage in the last months of her life really stood out to me and gave me some some special lessons and I was there right to the very last breath that she had so I learned a lot about um, watching people going through palliative care etc etc and then her two boys growing up and her two girls growing up around all of this um, I, I, I wanted to be at least some sort of sense of that light that she gave to us all it has passed at this moment, but hopefully I picked up on a lot of the things and I'm now taking that with me into all of their lives too, hopefully. Mm. And that special something where you really are able to give as though your friends are the a family, not just friends. You know, I, look, I've got a lot of, you know, we, we have a lot of friends, but you don't. You have a really tight core, but I've discovered that I'm open to people who give me joy and bring light into my life. And so I bring them in and they get given the opportunity to be part of the 
journey. Mm. So there are a number of acquaintances that that would be um, are very important to me because they bring something special. Yes. Nothing, nothing more than that. And you can be outrageous and have a lot of fun and everything I like else. to enjoy life. But you absolutely do. Mm-hmm. But it's that sense of love that just emanates from you that, that I just have always found from when I first met you. That's the nicest compliment anybody could give me. And I know some people might be sitting there listening to this going, oh, my goodness me, how could they ever have that involvement? I, I truly think that love is the only answer to everything. Hundred percent, and we disagree vehemently on yes. politics <laughs> and on all kinds of stuff. But it doesn't matter because I respect you, love you, and respect you enough Thank you for that. that you have your opinions for whatever stupid reasons. Yeah. But but um, but you that that's not a part of your relationship with other human but beings. But let me just say this to you about the differences with, with things. I mean, I think politics is truly the only thing we have a disagreement with because I, I love the way you're part of the family and everybody, uh, you know, because of Jane and your relationship, it's, you're there in the family. But, you know, I think what's happened to the world right now is we've lost that love. And I think whatever, if people think that the economy is the only thing in the world, if it's good, then life is good. I don't think that's the case. I agree with you. So, it's so, not. so to just to put a, a a bow around that whole thought, the world is being led by people who aren't showing that love to me, and now we're, and what's happened is it's all now emanating, coming down into everything we do in life. And so I see it on both sides of political parties, more so in the United States than here in Australia. We still seem to be a little naive to, uh, to stuff about politics. And I don't care whether you're left or whether you're right. Mm. Find some place to give some honest, open conversation, but you don't have to be right and the other person doesn't have to be right. Absolutely. Listening. And that's not where we're at. It's about <laughs> listening. It's about yeah. listening. There's not enough of it right now. And, not enough. And, Right, absolutely. And those, and I just want to also just comment on some of these special relationships yeah, thank you. that we've shared because we met at the wedding of two Australians who were living in Los Angeles and they had their wedding in Taos, New Mexico. And at the time, um, 80 people from around the world all came together to Taos to this wedding. And then these really special people, every 10 years, have had a reunion back in Taos. And And about to have another one, their 30th anniversary, now in Mexico. Exactly. So it is interesting, isn't it? But that's Loretta and Michael. You're talking about my two friends, a film director, Michael Reimer, and his wife, Loretta, who I've known for 50 years and more. Um, and and uh, uh, Loretta is, is it, yeah. and Loretta is a, is a delightful and beautiful friend and has been for so long. So that she, they attract people into their lives by giving out this light, yes, this, this friendliness, this sense of not being. Um, they're not there to contradict you. They're there to just be part of you. Absolutely. And I, and I love them for that. So you yeah, remember we met in, at that time down in uh, Santa Fe and what a beautiful place it was. And went on a three-day pilgrimage with 60 people. And then it grew to the next time 10 years later with, with about 80 to 90 people. And, and I believe that in Mexico for their 30th anniversary, there's going to be something like 120 or 130 Oh, my people. gosh. So <laughs> the numbers are growing. But isn't that a wonderful thing too? Absolutely. But nothing's easy all the time. You know, friendships and relationships of all sorts, you've got to put the effort in because it's about effort. And that's what it is. It's yeah, about completely. effort and it's finding time yeah. for the people you want to find time with. And, um, and, and people are welcoming. And don't be afraid to love. Yes. Some people find the word love to be such a cliche and they love to be able to put it down. Uh, you know, and, and you sense at, at times some people have anger about love. How interesting is that? To have anger about love. And I think if you dig deeper, that might just be because they feel like they weren't loved properly. And, and it's uh, everybody's background, what they've been through, what their experiences but are. But if you love yourself, and that's, what it, that, that's the hardest thing to do. If you love yourself, you can actually let the fires keep burning. 
Greatest yeah. Love of All is one of my very absolute favourite songs. Oh, yeah. So sure. you've had an illustrious career, and I apologise to those people listening because I didn't tell them what you do oh, and goodness, what you are. You. So talk a little bit about um, what you do and your current projects. And- I'm, a, I'm a film director, and, I, and my, my experiences were here, here in Australia when I first got going was at Crawford Productions on all those shows like Homicide and Sullivan's and Division. Welcome to our bad, but they've got to forgive into everything we do in life. And so I see it on both sides of political parties. Into America. Took, it was very... So we were quite unique and they want to be able to show me what I can do. And when there's an opportunity and the world has many of them, and if you can see them, you can go for them. You don't always get what you want but you might just get, get what you need. need. You're really true. And so I, I, and I think you've got to walk the talk. You can have all these cliches of life and um, talk about love, but you have to live it. Was it harder or easier going there with a partner? Um, I think life is always better when you have a partner. I think life is um, to share. And, uh, and I'm sure there's a lot of people listening that have lost their partners and think that life is suddenly no longer. That's the only thing I think I really want to try and not to do is that it sh- it, wherever you are in life, it shouldn't be about because you're attached to somebody else. And that doesn't mean you're disassociated. You should remove yourself from that other person, but y- you should share the journey but you have to be solid in yourself to be able to keep that journey going because one day something may happen Mm. And um, and things have happened across the journey for me, but I, I still believe in uh, me. I believe in me and I believe my job is to um, do the very best I can. And when I take my last breath, may people go, well, it was a joy. Whatever happened, it was a joy. So, and you obviously had a very rich um, showreel of work that you'd done. Was that a help over... No, absolutely. A hindrance. Because when I went to the United States, I only had Australian product. And that, that meant nothing to them. In particular, our accents were like totally the wrong thing. The They're time. much changed now. But in those days, 30 years ago, it was truly, they just didn't want to know about it. So I came back to Australia and I worked on a show called Mission Impossible, which is a TV series of the, of the feature film. And um, it was made by the Americans for CBS. And it was shot in Queensland and then in Melbourne. And I, want, I did it specifically so I could get some American accents on my showreel. And then people started to watch a little bit closer. But still, it, the work didn't come easily. It took me a year to get an agent. And then it took me another six months, about a year and a half of, of arriving there with um, um, a new family. And um, it took me a year and a half to actually get some work. So you've got to be persistent. Yes. And I, believe it, persistent and believe in yourself. Well, that's the only way you can have persistence is to believe in yourself. You know, do you think it's a little bit easier now for Australians to get into America or because so many Australians like yourself have succeeded, but also because there are infrastructures now like Australians in Film, which is a strong organisation um, and professional and in the industry? What What's your thought? I wonder whether, you know, it was easier then or whether it's easier now. The only thing I can look at is then, back in 30 years ago, there weren't as many Australians in the town and just and nobody truly wanted to know us. So we were quite unique and exotic. Nowadays, every you know, plane load of Australians that get off, and as we call them, the couch surfers, those young actors that want, you know, hope that thinking they're going to turn up and within two weeks they'll have a, an agent and then end up with a full time job that's paying them thousands and thousands of dollars. It's not a reality. I think now um, there's more opportunities because the doors have been opened up by the people b- that were before me and following me. So um, the bottom line to it is if you have an ambition, you have to follow it. And um, I personally would suggest to anybody who's considering it, or if you've got a son or a grandson, to encourage them to realise that you can't just turn up and the, the, the lottery will drop and you'll make a load of money. You have to truly work very hard. So, If you've got a passion for what you do, it's not even 
hard work. Not without passion, there's nothing else. If yeah. you haven't got the passion, if it's too hard now, don't go. <laughs> and also, you know, this whole thing about work and the work ethic... You know, I used to produce and direct television. We used to go on, out on shoots, two-week shoots, where I'd be at the shoot at 5 a.m. because that's what you do, but I never considered it work. Yeah. It was... Yeah. I enjoyed it so much it was a pleasure. Exhausting, but, uh, but not work, and I totally agree. When I went to the United States, I mean, a, a 16 to 18-hour day working was, is considered nothing. In fact, I, I remembered on some occasions I've done 22 hours uh, and you're exhausted. It's not very practical. And I'm glad that they're bringing in rules now where there's certain, they're sticking to 12 hour days in the United States. And I think in Australia, it's a 10 hour day. I mean, it's not eight hours. We don't do that these days and uh, certainly probably never will. But, but the hours were far too long and, and you don't get good work out of people after 15, 16 hours. Is there a difference today working in Australia or America? Well, I haven't worked back here since um, I did a, a movie called December Boys with um, Daniel Radcliffe, who was Harry Potter. And I did that now about eight years ago, I think, maybe a bit longer. Uh, so I don't know about Australia working terribly much other than what I'm trying to bring in to do here myself. But the, the differences are very little. Over there, it's a business probably more so than it was here. Uh, when I first uh, when I first started working, we loved doing it. So the business side of it wasn't really considered. Now you have to consider it a business. Of we, course, we have less money to make the material here, but I don't think money is what it's all about. It's about you know, firstly, the script is the key to everything. Without a good script, it doesn't matter how much money you throw at it; it won't work. But it is, it's about attitude. Do you go out looking for good scripts, all or the do time. they come to you? They, both. I mean, I think both, and, and it's hard because, you know, I have friends um, who often say, would you look at this story for me? And I look at it, I can only give them my opinion. That doesn't always ring true for them because I may not like it. I look for material that is universal. I look for material that has a hope and a positive sense of life. Mm. Um, I don't mind if something has a darkness to it at times, but I want to be able to sense that we can get it, move on from darkness if we if we have the right attitude. Mm. So the material may not fit into that. I also look for material that I think is going to be commercial. Mm. And not a lot of Australian projects um, do that. Um, although there's, a, there's a, an attitude now much more about finding something that can work beyond. But listen, whether you're in America or whether you're in Australia, drama is drama, comedy. Comedy is different. Comedy in Australia is different than comedy in the United States. So you've got to, you've got to find things that will stand out and it's got to be something that you love and that you've got a passion about. And I think that's the same whether you're a plumber or whether you're a carpenter or whether you're a doctor. Because there's so many more, more distribution channels now. There are. There's probably too many, and I think we're going to... It'll all filter down. There's too much streaming right now. Huge, huge volume. And I don't know how you decide which one you're going to go and watch. Exactly. And I, I just started watching a Turkish thing on Netflix... Uh -huh that I loved and really got into. And I was in the fifth episode and I just wanted to check how much I had left to go. 169 episodes. How can you do that? And every single one is you're on the edge of your seat. Yeah, that's good. So, that's a good I mean, thing. the fact... And I've been told that a lot of Turkish shows are like that. They but how did you find forever. that? How did you find that particular Somebody series? recommended it. That's Black, what it is, It's isn't called it? Black Money Love. Uh -huh. Black Money love right. and it's subtitles which I'm not crazy about uh -huh. but every single episode has me wanting to watch another. I'll so. check it out. Sounds like it's, like, good. Oh, it's, Sounds it's like amazing. It's good. That's good. And very you know like the looks and the yeah. eyes and all yeah, of yeah, that yeah. but still gets you in. Yeah. Um, the other thing in terms of passion and determination and all of that that I have a huge respect for and um, is the fact that you've been heavy and you've lost huge amounts of weight and you've managed to keep it off now this time for a really long time that takes a lot oh, of self-discipline a, lot of, is a lot of work and i appreciate you saying that and listen by, by the way i have put on a few pounds in the last uh, three months that i've been two months that i've been here in australia um but but yeah no it, it's again i was determined i had i had to do it number one for my health was that the motivating factor? without question and 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 i funny enough I never used to think I was fat. 
That was an interesting thing, uh, which is... Uh, yes. Whatever the reason no, that was. No, I understand. I Me too. I was. But, but since I've now uh, lost the weight and I can walk down a, 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 you know, a hallway without having to turn sideways, um, uh, do all of those things that I could do, I love being able to do that. But I also, you know, I've, I've discovered that um, I've got to keep on it. It's not a silver bullet. Is it a mindset or a discipline? Both. Or what is it? Both. You've got to, it's got to be a mindset that says this is how I see myself. Uh, I, I repeat, I didn't think I was fat, so I had to now look at the fact that I was. I mean, I jokingly say to people, um, I, was, I must have been anorexic because every time I looked in the mirror, I thought I was fat. Uh, and that's not true. Um, but it is something, it's a discipline you've got to have. And it isn't, you know, there, there are no silver bullets you've got. I, it's about portion control for me. Okay. Uh, you know, I, to, to be on diets, I find to be a waste of time because you can do it for three months and then suddenly you go off it and the, your body goes, what the hell's going on here? And suddenly all the weight comes back on again. Absolutely. Um, and that's of no value. And I, and I have friends right now who are going through the gyms and they're killing themselves trying to do it. I think you've just got to find a lifestyle that's going to be there for the rest of your life. Not for a period of time. Yes, lifestyle is really, absolutely, really important, and that's what I because I've had weight issues all my life as well, and it's my it's the mindset, and you've got to click something in your mind that allows you to think differently about the actual food because I love food. I do. Isn't that interesting about relationships too? The same thing has to be there for relationships. You've got to think about that thing that we, we, we have difficulties in relationships and you've got to think about that thing that causes the, the eruption that may be the problem in the relationship, the disrespect that may come from it, from whatever that issue was. And you've got to change the thinking. That's why I say my biggest thing I've learned is, is, is pause. To pause, P-A-U-S-E, not P-A-W-S. <laughs> To pause and and before you react to something, just stop and truly think about it. And you can, it's like with food, before you shovel it down your face, which is what I used to do, I have to stop and look at it and think, how much do I really need this right now? How can I readjust my thinking towards this food? And, And it is a conscious effort. Every time I eat, I have to do that. Yeah. So. I love not just the taste but the texture and the smell and everything. But I can be satisfied with a little bit. Yes. I don't need to finish the whole plate. So your portion control thing I think also doing a... I I now eat um, probably four meals a day rather than three. Um, And they're small. Because I I, I have still the pattern is in my brain to... To I watch TV shows and I love the cooking shows, mm. and then I get hungry. Yes. and then I realise when I'm watching television, if a if a commercial comes on for something good to eat on television, it creates that sort of click in your brain. And the other thing that's helping me at the moment is this intermittent fasting, the sixteen eight. Have you? I've heard about that. Yeah, yeah. So whenever you stop eating, and you don't have to stop eating whenever, but even if you stop eating at midnight then you don't start eating again until four in the afternoon. Sure. And that then I, works. And, and then I say, and then love yourself. You've got to find the way because sometimes food addictions are created from people trying to hide behind yes. some other pain. And um, we all have pain. It's only human. If you can... I, I was shocked at how many people cannot look at themselves in the mirror and say... I like you yeah. even before I love you. Yeah. It's a tough thing to say I like you. I mean, it really is. It's a hard effort you've got to put in. It's, but, but, and yet, yet when you've got to practice it by walking down the street and looking at other people and smiling at them because once yes. you learn that you can love other people, then it starts to become, oh, well, hang on a second, I've got to look in the mirror and say I love you too. That's the hardest bit. Yes. Hardest bit. And that is really the key to everything. If you can be kinder to people, yeah, sure, we'll be kind to yourself too. And smile and smile. And exactly right, exactly right. Because you have no idea what other people are doing no. or been through, and your smile could yeah. mean absolute worlds. So. Hey, listen, all these things are correct, and I, and I don't want people to get the impression that I think I'm fabulous. 
because I but have. But you are. I, thank you. I, and by the way, I am in my own head. And <laughs> yes, I, I love and that. Can... But, I, but I'm like everybody else. I, I have the bad times and the good times. I have the days when, you know, I eat the bear and the next day the bear eats me. I mean, that's just life. Yes. You've got to try and then adjust and move on. And be easy on yourself. And be easy on yourself. And let go of the past. I mean, people say you've got to remember it. I don't think we're taught really to, to how to let go of things. We, we bring a lot of this energy with yes. us. And it's, um, yes. It's easy to say, but you've got to let go of the past. Let go of the past, mm-hmm. what happened in childhood. Mm-hmm. Today is a new day. Let's move forward from here. Sure. I totally agree. Every moment is a new creation. Every single moment. And I got that from a Tony Robbins um, video where he was talking about how he had a very um, wealthy, cafured woman in his office and she was going on and ranting and just really making herself crazy. And he took a glass of water and threw it at her and she stopped. And she stopped and he was able to start again in a a new way about what she was talking about. But, but she instantly let go of where yeah. she was. I think there's probably ways of learning that without having a <laughs> glass of water thrown at you. Yes. But, but, it, but, but also, let me tell you, and I've had relationships in the past with people who are positive. There's nothing worse than somebody who's negative all the time. There's nothing yes. worse other than a person who's positive all the time. <laughs> because I think being positive all the time says you're not really experiencing and being honest with yourself about what life is because this isn't a test but you see those times for positive people that are not so positive are valuable because it's only when you're upset or only when you're missing something that you can truly define what it is that you truly want yeah, I think... Um, and it's good to watch Yeah, things. no, that's true. Listen, keep keep, keep growing, keep <laughs> moving forward. That's what it's all about. Whatever gets you going, whatever gets you happy and laughing. And I've got to tell you, laughter is, to me, a very important thing. Yes. I, sometimes it doesn't work and my jokes are pretty bad taste, but I, I know that when, pe- when you can get somebody to at least say, oh, that's a terrible joke, at least they've responded in some fashion to something, you've got to find a way to keep life... Going up rather than down. down. <laughs> what are the things that you do when you feel that you'd like a lift? Um, I look at photographs of my family, particularly when I'm in the United States. You know, I live, I live a long way away from the family and, um, and that makes it tricky at times. So thank goodness for FaceTime and all of these sort of um, digital connection things because um, you can keep the connection with people by looking at them and laughing with them and reacting Mm. and responding. I don't agree with it every day. Kids are on their telephones just constantly trying to find Mm. a way to connect with people because that's causing a great deal of problems too for our young. They're not not connected. Interdependency. They don't know how to deal with it. Uh, A a friend of mine was talking to her son recently. The son lives in Perth. And she asked him about his relationships and how he would, had he seen various friends. And he said, oh, no, we, we were in touch. When, when was the last time you saw Oh, no, we were in touch just yesterday. But when was the last time you saw them? Oh, I haven't seen them for two or three months. So they think by communicating through a text that that's a, that's a connection. It's not. But you know what? It, I have friends that I don't see or speak to for months or even years. Yeah. And you pick up from where you left off. So the connection... That's a different story, though. Yeah. I think that's a different story. That's just about... There's a, there's a, I, I, you know, I'm a believer in, in spiritual thinking. I think there are certain souls that we do have a beyond what our everyday thinking is. And I know some people go, that's not real, that's too silly. But I think there are certain people you can just drop off and pick up with. Yes. I'm not sure that's what we're talking about with my, kids. My theory on that is... In the Jewish religion, when a child is born, you get a bit of a, a, a spirit from a huge collective consciousness comes into that. the child, and we call it a neshama, a spirit. Neshama, I like that word. So my belief is that when you die, it's only your body that dies, and that spirit goes into this huge collective consciousness so that when that spirit is put into a child, it could actually be made up of 10, 20, 100 previous spirits that have been on earth. Uh And so the connection we feel is perhaps 
because you part of your spirit is part of another of the same spirit from another life. Well, that make, that's illogical and makes sense to me. I mean, yeah. I'm not. Sure, I mean, I probably have a differing view to it all because the soul world is the soul world, and how many are in there, and whether you're part of multiples. But I like the idea of connection. And that connection, that's, is that recognition from a previous, because also, sorry, I'm not religious, but. I just remembered, it did say that when Moses gave the Ten Commandments to, when God gave the Ten Commandments through Moses to the Jewish people, every soul that ever was or ever would be was collected at the foot of Mount Sinai. Mm -hmm. So there weren't that many people. And so how is it possible that, um, that that could be true? And it's possible because it's the soul and the spirit that can then be broken up but a little thing but you were quite a scallywag when you were young you started off in radio and you spent a stint in jail I did and listen by the way <laughs> hopefully I'm a scallywag now too in my older mature years it's just that I know how to deal with it a lot easier I lived um in in when I was uh, born I was born in in Fitzroy and uh, then raised in Sunshine and Carlton and in Fitzroy back again and, um, you know, the, it was very much a lower socioeconomic level lifestyle. Uh, we didn't have a lot of money. Um, and so as I grew up and became a teenager, I ended up uh, in, in a gang, the Sharpie gang, because in the 60s, wow. you were in, if you were living in the inner suburbs, you were either in the Sharpies or the Mods, and then there were the Rockers, and in the earlier days, it was the, uh, the Bodgies and the Widgies and all that stuff. So being in a gang was simply being able to have a connection to a group of friends. You didn't all go to the same school, but maybe you were connected in some way through other friends. And we used to hang out around street corners because we had nothing to... There, was, there wasn't the computer. There wasn't the cell phone to have. So, you know, and then there were social clubs that belonged to the local churches and whatever. And you'd go occasionally, but it wasn't that much fun. So we would stand around street corners and collect. And then when we got to the age where we liked music, uh, in our early 15s and 16s, we'd go to all the, the dances around Melbourne and try and get in. But there'd be 50 or 60 of us all dressed in very similar clothing. The, sh the, the Sharpies had, were very well dressed, but it was maroon um, uh, T-shirts and sweaters and cardigans and pinstripe blue baggy trousers and very stylish Italian sh chisel toe How shoes. How cool we, were you? With very short hair. <laughs> I know that the Sharpies in the 70s suddenly put on this mullet at the back, which looked pretty <laughs> silly, but we were very swish -o. And we'd go to these dances and we weren't allowed in because what they called us the troublemakers. And the more you were told you were a troublemaker, the more you became one. And then I, at the age of uh, seven, at 17, um, I had an occasion to be in a, with a whole gang of uh, Sharpies trying to get into the Q Town Hall. And, um, and, and we weren't allowed to go in. We'd, we'd congregate and there'd be people from all suburbs the Preston boys, the Richmond boys, the Collingwood <laughs> boys, or whatever, with their girlfriends and whatever. And there could be 200, 300 people trying to get in and standing on the, the, park, the park opposite. And I saw my cousin being uh, escorted around a corner of the building uh, by the police and I went to walk over to find out what was happening. And by the time they got into the police car, they banged his head and he, he bled wow. profusely and I went charging forward and there was my biggest mistake. I went to defend my cousin, but it became all those people standing behind me suddenly started to come up as well. Wow. And the police realised that there was a danger going on and they grabbed me, I was put into the police car and the eventual end of all of that was I was charged with uh, assaulting five detectives, which wasn't quite correct, but what it did do, it changed my life. I was working in radio at the time at 3AK. I was doing radio shows for 3PD Pentridge on the weekends. Uh, because I wanted to share with these guys and, that were in prison the joy of music and everything else. And I'd talk about various things that had happened around town. And I ended up um, losing my job Gosh. and being put into prison um, for three months. And the first thing that I heard when I was put into a prison cell at Pentridge was a radio show that I had uh, done probably a month or two before. Wow. And it made me realise that I was now in charge of my life at 17 and I should have been in better charge than I was right then. It changed everything. 
I, I, I was disrespectful and, and unsociable, if I think about it now, as a young teenager, because I was in gangs, but it made me realise I had to be part of the community, and, I, and, it, and, and it turned me around. Hence, once I got out of prison, I got to, um, I got to go into, re- into uh, working at Crawford Productions and various other things, mm, and, really and a turned turning. my life around. It was a t- out of every chaotic moment in my life, something good has come out of it eventually like a guiding light. Can I ask you just also before we finish to talk about your dad because you were only eight when you lost him mm. and that well, also... Actually didn't lo- I lost him in one way. Um, I, I didn't lose him until I was actually in my 20s but I was eight when he had a stroke. He was, uh, he was 32 and during the Second World War he was in the engine rooms of many ships that were torpedoed and he wasn't able to, like many men of that, of that period, be able to talk about the emotions that we can talk about now. And um, so he was quite silent about it. And what eventually occurred, he had a stroke at 32 and then died at the age of 56. Mm. That changed my life in another way too because at 30, when I was eight, I was being raised by women. My grandmothers and my aunts had to take over because my mother was carefully taking care of my dad. So it's probably why I'm not frightened of women today, because mm. I was raised by, I was like the wolf. <laughs> no, raised by a pack of wolves. Um, and uh, so, so I, I, I respect and appreciate women. And your background is, uh, it, uh, your parents came from... from, from well, I'm sixth generation Australian, oh. um, but by, my family were from Ireland, from Kilkenny and also Northern England. Right. Um, and, and Scotland. So there was a mix of all sorts, but mostly Irish. And I think the Irish scallywag sort of came out of me and still remains there. But sixth generation and proud of it. Mm. And then you had a wonderful relationship with your mother. And... Very much so, until she passed away when she was 88. Look, uh, my mother showed me respect and, and I taught her how to say I love you, which was an important part Very of her journey and mine as well. Because that generation, even though you knew they loved you, yeah. didn't talk about it. My mother was, um, was the last one of, I think it was 10 in the family. Uh, my grandmother was pregnant with my mother when she found her husband had been trampled by his favourite horse in the backyard. And of course, and my, my grandmother was seven months pregnant. So suddenly she's without a husband, she's got 10 other kids and here comes another child. So the anxiety that my mother suffered from, you can appreciate, was put in her at that very early stage. But, and didn't, she didn't know how to say, I love you. She showed it in many other ways. She was a very loving woman. Yes. But um, we, we both taught each other something, yes. which, was, which was wonderful. I remember once when my father came to visit me in Los Angeles, sitting there and just saying to him, look, you never, I have never heard you say I love you. And he sort of looked at me, you know who I love. But it was, that's, that was that generation. And people say, oh, but you know I love you. Yes. No, but sometimes people don't. So it's important to at least say it at some stage. And every single day to those that you love because you never know when it's going to Abs- be your absolutely last. Absolutely correct. Make, make it a good day. Rod Hardy, thank you so much. I am so grateful we were able to finally sit down and do Absolutely. this. Absolutely. I'm glad I'm here in Australia and I could do it too. I look forward to seeing you for, and our friendship continuing for many years to come. Thanks so much, Lee.